It's now time for oral questions, and I recognize the member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Earlier this morning, government members on the Standing Committee on Public Accounts voted down a measure to have the auditor conduct a complete review of the Premier's plan to scrap renewable energy contracts. Conservative members have also blocked efforts to have the Assembly request a review, and the Premier himself has refused to make the request. The price tag for this mess has already ballooned from zero to $231 million. Why is the Premier unwilling to allow a transparent review? Thank you. The question is addressed to the Premier. Minister of Energy. The Minister of Energy, Northern Belt and Line. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When the government tabled the 2018-19 uh, uh, public accounts, the auditor, uh, in fact, reviewed our allocation for the wind down of these projects. And in speaking to the media yesterday, she stated that her office, quote, uh, already looked at the costs associated with the cancellation of the contracts. The audit looked at all of the big contracts and a sample of a number of smaller deals to determine whether the government's calculations were reasonable. The auditor herself concluded, and I quote directly, Based on the review of the contracts and estimates of the payment, I find the audit to be clean. Mr. Speaker, the auditor reaffirmed her position this morning at committee. Thank you. A supplementary question? Colonel Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. It wasn't that long ago that government members, now government members, were sitting in the Public Accounts Committee demanding the auditor look into the Liberal gas plant scandal. At the time, the now Minister of Economic Development said, quote, the auditor needs to have that opportunity to let us know what's going on. At the time, the now Deputy Premier was on hand in that same committee echoing those same concerns. And at the time, the now Premier was calling into AM radio stations saying they're hoodwinking the people of Ontario. Now, just like the Liberals, the Conservatives seem to prefer hoodwinking over transparency. Why? The member to withdraw. To withdraw. Withdraw. And place this question. Now, just like the Liberals, why is it that the Conservatives <laughs> prefer the Liberal method of dealing with these questions? Why is that? Minister of Energy to reply. Speaker, here, 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 here's, some, here's some interesting context. The Green Energy Act, of course, which gave rise to the 750 projects that we cancelled, turns out that the NDP voted in favour of the Green Energy Act that forced unnecessary renewable projects onto unwilling communities at a price that they couldn't afford. Ninety communities passed motions to declare themselves unwilling to host the Green Energy Act. Billings Township in Algoma, Manitoulin. LaSalle in Windsor, Essex, the entire region of Niagara. Oh. The former mayor of, of uh, Warwick, Todd Case, declared his community an unwilling host then, retired after 18 years to run for the Ontario NDP in the 2018 election, and sadly, he lost. He didn't get elected. His party Order. didn't stand for what he believed in, Mr. Speaker. Why won't they support us in getting rid of expensive contracts that made our system more complex and more expensive, Mr. Speaker? A hundred final supplementary. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, again to the Premier. At a time when the rest of the world is rushing to embrace renewable energy, the Ford government is spending hundreds of millions of dollars tearing it down. Order and quoting climate change deniers while they do it. And if that wasn't bad enough, they are doing everything they can to ensure that families stuck with the bill don't know the real cost. If the Premier is proud of this mess, Order. why is he afraid of a review? Minister of Energy again. Wow, Mr. Speaker. You know, I spent last week and the early part of this week going through all of the increases from 2005 to 2015, a whopping 22 per cent in one year that nobody knew, it, knew about, Mr. Speaker. The thing is, 
is that the former Liberal government was in cahoots with the NDP, Mr. Speaker, and nobody could see this on their bill. That's why we followed the Auditor Order. General's uh, recommendations to ensure, Mr. Speaker, that it was very clear on people's bill how much this subsidy cost, Mr. Speaker, moving forward in a fully transparent manner and work moving forward, Mr. Speaker, ensuring that we remove all the pressures on this incredibly complex and costly system, all because of the official opposition and their support for the previous Liberal government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, once again, the member for Toronto Danville. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. For over a week, the Premier has insisted that the hundreds of millions of dollars he spent cancelling clean energy contracts and tearing down wind farms would bring down hydro bills. It was only last year that he promised to reduce rates by 12 per cent. Can the Premier explain why the rates keep going up? The question is to the Premier. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, I just want to remind the opposition uh, leader and, and the Liberals, they put us in, this, in a spot that we're the most uncompetitive energy cost in North America. 300,000 manufacturing jobs left Ontario because of the NDP and the Liberals. As I said the other day, there's never been Order. a larger transfer of wealth from the hard-working taxpayers, ratepayers of this province, and small businesses from the, this Green Energy Act, I call it the Green Energy Scam, people made hundreds of millions of dollars, Mr. Speaker, off the backs of this big scam they came up with. We're saving hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on energy right across the board. That's why we created 252,400 jobs since we've been elected. Supplementary question. Well, I'm sure the Premier was of the same opinion when he promised to reduce rates by 12 per cent, which he has not done. <laughs> Throughout the week, we've been raising concerns of Ontario families feeling squeezed by high hydro rates. Glynis Hill, the senior from London Fanshawe, who reads by candlelight and wears a coat inside her house to avoid using electricity. Dawn Van Nostrand, a retiree on a fixed income who has seen her bills climb by 7 per cent when the Premier promised they would come down by 12 per cent. When will we see the reduction Order. that the Premier promised? Premier. Again, Mr. Speaker, I just, just want to remind the opposition the reason the hydro rates are at the rate they're right now is because of them. Exactly. Because, because of all the backroom deals and, and all the political order. insiders Member for Essex hundreds come to order. of millions of dollars on the backs of the ratepayers. That's the reason this happened, and we will make sure we hit our 12 percent reduction before the end of this term, here, here. as we promised. We're driving efficiencies through this, this province. Our province is booming. We're leading North America in economic growth and jobs. Our province is booming. We don't, Mr. Speaker, we don't have enough people. We don't have enough people to fill all the jobs that we have here in Ontario Order. because of the policies that we put forward in, in uh, the House here, Mr. Speaker. But Response. we're going to continue to make sure that people thrive, prosper, and grow in Ontario. Here, here. The final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. Unfortunately for the Premier, denying climate change and tearing down wind farms is Order. not an effective way to drive down hydro bills. In fact, it wastes hundreds of millions of dollars and has left seniors like Don and Glynis paying more. Is the Premier ready to admit he has no plan to deliver on his promise of a 12 per cent reduction? Premier, to reply. Well, let me first address this first question, Mr. Speaker. We're leading Canada in emissions reductions at 22.5 per cent. Because of the great environmental plan that we have, they're going to make sure we have clean air, clean lake, clean rivers, clean parks. We're leading the country. We're going to hit our 30 percent, and hopefully, Mr. Speaker, we'll exceed the 30 percent target from Paris Accord uh, 2030. We're well on our way, and again, I'm so proud of our environmental Order. policies. But you don't have to tax the hardworking people of this province to be environmentally friendly. That's what they believe in, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. 
Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Premier. On Monday, this legislature unanimously passed an important motion declaring Ontario's opposition to Quebec's Bill 21, a ban on religious symbols in public service that is discriminatory and violates people's basic human rights. The motion calls on this government to formally inform the government of Quebec that this is a discriminatory bill and it must be repealed. The Premier will be meeting with Quebec Premier Francois Legault this Friday. Can the Premier assure us that this motion, which was passed unanimously here in the Assembly of Ontario, will be a topic of discussion? The question is addressed to the Premier. House Leader. The House Leader. Order. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, uh, appreciate the question from the Honourable Member. Look, Mr. Speaker, uh, this House has, uh, has spoken uh, unanimously on two occasions uh, on this matter. Uh, the Premier has spoken on behalf of the government uh, on multiple occasions on, uh, on, on this matter, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, uh, our opinions on this are, are very clear. During the debate, I thought uh, it was uh, a very respectful, remarkable uh, debate, really, in, in many aspects, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to continue to play politics on this. I think the, the House has spoken clearly. And and, uh, and uh, I think that message has gotten through. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and through you to uh, the government House Leader. The question is for the Premier, and the House has spoken, but we need the Premier to speak up. The Premier's office has informed reporters so that the Premier has no intention of discussing this legislature's concerns about Bill 21 when he meets Premier Legault this week. Silence is simply not an option when basic human rights in this country are at stake, Mr. Speaker. The Premier knows this House unanimously passed our motion to condemn Bill 21. The Premier should also know that religious discrimination in all its forms has no place here in Ontario or anywhere else in this country. Speaker, the Premier needs to take a stand. This legislature has Order. unanimously demanded that he take a stand. Why won't he do that. The question has been referred to the government house leader. Mr. Speaker, the Premier has spoken multiple times on this and has expressed our opinions very clearly on this matter. The Premier has said on multiple occasions that a law like this would never have a place in the province of Ontario. I'm not sure how much clearer he can be than that, Mr. Speaker. This House has spoken on two occasions unanimously, Mr. Speaker, and we are now going to move forward. The opinions of this House on two occasions, the opinion of this Premier on multiple occasions on this topic have been well known, Mr. Speaker, but at the same time, we heard a number of remarkable speeches, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Small Business, who talked about being the first turban-wearing uh, 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 Sikh to be in Cabinet, Mr. Speaker. We heard from, uh, from the member from my work centre who fled, uh, who fled uh, the Soviet Union to, to come to Canada, Mr. Speaker. Those are the types of people that we have in this caucus. We heard from the member of Milton who talked about his family leaving to come to Bons. a free place, Mr. Speaker. That's what we want to talk about. We want to talk about what unifies the country, not what divides the country. We hope that the opposition would actually join us. Stop the clock. I apologize to the government host leader for having to interrupt. I couldn't hear what he was saying. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was a pleasure to speak here today and, and to uh, ask a question to the Premier. Premier, recently our government made an announcement in support of dental care for seniors. In my writing, many seniors who I have spoken with have raised concern for the last 15 years the previous govern government neglected them and ignored their contributions and made life harder. Whether it was increasing electricity costs, that forced many individuals to choose between heating and eating or long-term health care wait lines, our government values the contributions that seniors have made for the betterment of our province. Can you elaborate on the support we are providing for seniors as part of this new dental program? Mr. Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank an all-star MPP from Oakville. He's as popular as anything out in Oakville, by the way, leading the, the province. And I, I, Mr. Speaker, I also want to thank the great leadership from our, our Minister of Health and our Minister of Seniors and Accessibility on, the, on this file here. They're doing an incredible job. As part of our plan to end hallway health care, Mr. Speaker, we're investing in programs that keep seniors healthy in their communities longer. Each year, more than 60,000 seniors show up to emergency departments for help on dental uh, pain and, in, and infection. That's unacceptable. But, Mr. Speaker, 
we're changing that. We're going to make sure that we deliver great dental plan for over 100,000 seniors of low income. We're spending over $90 million to help seniors Spons? that they don't have to show up to the emergency room. They can go to a dentist and actually get proper dental care and not worry about a whopping bill. Anyways, we'll, we'll talk more on, on the second question. Supplementary question. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. And again, uh, my question to the Premier, and I thank the Premier for that answer. As has been previously reported, at least two-thirds of low-income seniors do not have access to proper dental insurance. As a result, untreated oral health issues can lead to chronic disease and lower the quality of life. This is a shocking statistic and speaks to the immediate action that needs to be taken by our government. For far too long, senior health care concerns were considered an afterthought by the previous government. I am proud of the actions and the investments that our government is making to lead the way on this very important issue. Premier, can you describe further on what is provided in this program and other supports our government is committing to seniors of this province? Premier. Thank you. I'd like to thank the member for his question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, do you know what's ironic? What's ironic? is the NDP voted against the seniors on this bill. It's, yeah. it's absolutely yeah. staggering. Yeah. They don't want to take care of seniors. No. We want to take care of seniors. I, I was shocked, actually, they voted against it. Yep. But again, Mr. Uh, Speaker, we're, we're delivering to 100,000 low-income seniors Sad. $90 million of dental care. Yep. And the services covered will include examinations, oral surgery, x-rays and repairs for broken teeth and cavities. This builds upon the other supports we're providing for seniors, which include the Seniors Community Grant Program funding. That's an important uh, funding mechanism that seniors, seniors uh, can go out and have programs up to $25,000 per project Response. that encourages activity. Mr. Speaker, seniors active living center programs, again, community-based non-residential programs that promote active living. There are now over 300 programs. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Since day one, this government has tried to drive a wedge between parents, students, and the people who deliver their education. This week, as teachers take job action, parents and students are showing that that tactic won't work. Parents in Ottawa told the CBC, and I quote, I think there are many other areas where the government could explore if it wished to do so, not least of which would be not cancelling a bunch of green energy projects at a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. Speaker, parents and students are standing shoulder to shoulder with teachers to defend public education. Why won't the Premier do the same thing? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Education. Pardon me, Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government is committed to renewing schools in this province. The member will know that of the green fund that was created, uh, 97 cents the dollar was expended to help improve public schools. That was left out of the question. But what was also left out of the question is the fact that our government has invested $550 million this year alone to improve Order. schools and to build new schools, in addition to maintaining over a billion dollars in renewal funding, because after 15 years of the Liberals having left so many schools in a place of disrepair. We are investing in our schools, we are updating our curriculum, and we're giving hope to young people to achieve their full potential in this province. Supplementary question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to go back to the Premier again. Parent organizations are springing up across the province. Groups like the Ontario Parent Action Network, uh, which started right here in Toronto, are helping push back against the government's agenda of cuts, breaking down misinformation Order. and distributing information online. As one parent in my community put it, if you care Order. about your kids, you need to care about their teachers. Uh, speaker, with 10,000 teaching positions on the chopping block and the 60,000 courses that are going to go with them, it is no surprise that Ontarians are pushing back. Will the Minister of Education and the Premier take a break from their daily press conferences and start repairing some of the damage that their failed policies have Order. Minister of Education. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, the government's aim is to keep kids in class by getting good negotiated settlements. This morning, the press conference that was noted in a pejorative way was actually to announce five steps were taken to counter the scourge of bullying in this province. Order. Mr. Speaker, we announced yeah. that Christina Modest, the you MPP, like will be from Scarborough Centre. A former teacher will lead initiatives and work to counter bullying in our schools. We announced a province-wide survey no to that. empower students to have a say and to share their voice in their narrative. We announced new training for education workers, professional development to help Order. reduce the scourge of bullying and de-escalate these situations. We announced a review of school reporting practices of bullying in out. schools and public and Catholic schools, Order. and we announced an evaluation of the definition of bullying. Support these us. are the initiatives Order. we're taking to improve safety, and I'd hope every member of this legislature would stand with our government to keep our children safe. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Climate scientists have long estimated that Canada is warming at a rate twice as fast as the rest of the world. Yesterday, the UN released an even further damning report on the inaction of G20 countries, including Canada. It is now clear that the targets set in 2015 will be insufficient to prevent catastrophic warming. Mr. Speaker, our communities are already feeling the effects of climate change. Floodings due to rising lake levels, extreme weather, fires are undermining the well-being of our communities. And yet, we're the lucky ones. In the Global South, by 2050, it is estimated that due to heat, drought, and rising sea levels, these places will become uninhabitable. Speaker, through you to the Premier. We are global citizens, Question. and it is our civic duty to take action. Does this Premier and his government believe that climate change is real, and what are they going to do to respond? The question is addressed to the Premier. Minister of Environment. Referred to the Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, and uh, before I answer the question, I just want to say hello to Warren Scott and Daryl Smith, who are here from the St. Thomas Fire Department. Thanks for being here today. But listen, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm not sure where the member opposite's coming from. Her government set the targets that uh, were agreed upon in Paris uh, for 2030 targets, and we're way on our way to making sure we reach those targets, Mr. Speaker. We have an environment plan in Ontario that we put forward, a living document that we're hoping for uh, others to join in. A member from the Green Party, Mr. Speaker, has numerous times spoken to us about uh, helping us uh, develop a plan for the environment, Mr. Speaker. The NDP have yet to come forward with a plan, Mr. Speaker. They said maybe sometime Order. next year they might have something. It's 2019, Mr. Speaker. It's time to have uh, action on climate, Order. and that is what we're doing through our environmental plan, Mr. Speaker, Lots. by increasing the renewables and our fuels, to have an impact assessment across this province to see how the climate change is going to affect our province, and we can take hold and take focus on how we're going to deal with that, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And indeed, we did commit to the Paris Agreement in 2016. Canada affirmed its commitment. But yet, this government, Mr. Speaker, has put our plans in reverse. By its actions, it has weakened our commitments to those targets. Today, the youth of this province are taking this government to court because of its inaction on climate change and its refusal to acknowledge that we are in a climate crisis and we must respond now. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, will this minister take ambitious, this, these ambitious targets seriously and make sure that Ontario does its part once again to address the issues of climate change and stop denying that it's occurring and making sure that we take this seriously in our policies and in our programs and in our response? Thank you. The minister to reply. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite. Uh, again, for that question, and I advise her to uh, Google or internet search, contact my office. We'll send you a copy of our Made in Ontario Environment Plan, which is doing just that. It's taking action, working on the success of uh, our, our goals to reach the 30 percent targets. Uh, Ontario leads the way. We're already 22 percent uh, below the 2005 emission targets in this province, Mr. Speaker. Again, I'll add in. We've, we've added uh, working towards 15 percent renewable content in our gasoline, which will lower emissions, Mr. Speaker. We have finalized our emissions performance standards for large 
uh, industrial emitters to ensure polluters are accountable for the greenhouse gas emissions. We're waiting for the federal government to act and approve that, Mr. Speaker. We've uh, issued green bonds of $1.7 billion to capitalize on provincials' ability to raise funds to deal with uh, uh, climate change. Mr. Speaker, uh, we've announced $30 billion to build new subways Spons? in the city of Toronto. That alone will reduce emissions by a million tons when working. Mr. Speaker, we are doing our work. Bring us more ideas, Mr. Speaker. That's what I ask the members opposite. Let's work together in a nonpartisan fashion and clean up our environment. And Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, agriculture creates amazing opportunities for economic growth and innovative ways for farmers to create economic solutions for a variety of issues. I'm encouraged that our government is supporting these opportunities through the proposed changes and rules surrounding the biogas sector. Last week, our government launched consultations to identify ways farmers in Ontario can expand the emerging renewable natural gas market. Can the minister explain why he is looking at making these changes? Questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Perry Sound Muskoka for that great question. Mr. Speaker, agriculture in Ontario is an, is an exciting frontier for innovation, creative economic and environmental solutions. That's why we announced that our government will launch consultations to identify ways in which farmers can expand the emerging natural gas market that would make Ontario a North America leader in the biogas sector. These consultations will focus on identifying potential changes that would enable the biogas sector to access new markets for renewable natural gas through red tape reduction. We want these consultations to pinpoint the potential changes that could enable Ontario's $35 million a year biogas sector to grow by 50 per cent over five years. Mr. Speaker, this is an exciting time for agriculture in Ontario. Here, I'm excited. Very good. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to seeing the many innovative ways in which Ontario can expand its biogas sector. The best part is that we can stimulate economic growth in this sector by cutting red tape and helping the environment. Mr. Speaker, these consultations are a great first step, and I trust we will receive many valuable suggestions over the next while. Will the Speaker Will, will the minister please tell us more about some of the proposed changes our government is considering? Thank you. Once again, Mr. Thank Mayor, you again, Mr. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the excellent supplementary question. Our government is proposing new rules for on-farm aerobic digesters to unleash the economic opportunity of the biogas sector while protecting the environment. This means economic solutions for food and organic waste encouraging the recycling of nutrients, including organic matter, and reducing greenhouse gases. The proposed consultation will include discussions about enabling new on-farm aerobic digesters to be approved faster, easier, and less cost, giving farmers a new source of revenue in the emerging renewable natural gas market. Mr. Speaker, these proposed changes would help make Ontario a leader in the biogas sector. This would cut red tape, make life easier for farmers, expand their econo economic opportunities, and help provide solutions to some of the challenges outlined in our government's Made in Ontario Environment Plan. Here, here. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Speaker, and through you, my question is to the Minister of Energy. For the last two days, the minister has quoted a climate conspiracy website that denies that the scientific evidence of the climate crisis. In fact, he called it his favorite, his favorite periodical. Now, I understand that the Toronto Star, which once referred to him, and I quote, as an unctuous bloviator, probably isn't his fave. But this, a conspiracy. Ask the member to withdraw. I withdraw, Speaker. But this, a website that has called climate science dishonest, has said that global warming has nothing to do with pollution has called Greta Thunberg mentally ill. It's a conspiracy website that no one has ever cited in Parliament, in the U.S. Congress, in the U.S. Senate, but that didn't stop the minister 
from who told the media he reads it to support Question. both sides of the climate change argument. Would the minister clarify his position to the House? Questions to the Minister of, the, of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as a well-studied person, I take every opportunity, whether it's on the internet or sources of literature, to consider different points of view, Mr. Speaker. And indeed, uh, when we think about Ontario, thank, thank goodness that we have uh, those differing viewpoints. Because in reality, while the NDP were busy supporting uh, the previous Liberal government to put some of the most expensive kinds of projects into our system, making it more complex and more importantly, more expensive, Mr. Speaker, we took the right path, Mr. Speaker. We followed all of the Auditor General's recommendations. We now see a clear path to be able to offer uh, ratepayers a, a reduction, Mr. Speaker. And it started out with taking down 750 projects, which had a net present value of $790 million today, Mr. Speaker. That's what net present value uh, means Response. for the benefit of the NDP. That's supported by communities across this province, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be happy to share in the supplementary just how many of those communities there were. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and I wonder what the political inspiration was for claiming that there are both sides to an issue when there is really only one. The minister defended this government's scrapping of clean energy contracts by quoting this blog that compares those who believe in climate change to Nazis. Ontarians know that hate-filled conspiracy theories are the wrong foundation for public policy, and the minister should know better than to look to climate change denial websites to get, I can't say facts here, but whatever it was, when every other Ontarian is looking for leadership to combat the effects of climate change, this government is undermining progress at every step of the way. When is this government going to stop defending their policies, which are based on climate change denial? Minister of Environment. Bird to the Minister of Environment, Conservation, Parks. Order. Thanks very Order. much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And you know, um, the member opposite. That was just basically untrue. What uh, he put forward at this uh, legislature. I have to ask the member to withdraw. I'll I'll take that back, Mr. Speaker. Withdraw. Listen, uh, we uh, are coming up to a year now that uh, we put forward a, a plan uh, for the people of this province, the, the government of Ontario, to work towards reaching our goals of our targets, Paris targets, at 30 percent emissions below 2005. We're at 22 percent, Mr. Speaker. We've spent the last year beginning implementation uh, that will re reap rewards down the way, Mr. Speaker. I've already made mention, but uh, we do have that impact assessment, the first of its kind in Ontario, mirrored much like the one that happened in the United Kingdom, Mr. Speaker. This will be an analysis of uh, what is occurring in Ontario due to climate change so that we can become more resilient and respond to the changes that are going on, Mr. Speaker, and those municipalities and communities and Indigenous communities can focus in on how best to deal with this climate action, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to fight. Very much. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Markham Unionville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Minister, communities across Ontario continue to be affected by the ongoing opioid crisis. A recent report co-authored by Public Health Ontario, the Office of Chief Coroner Ontario and the Ontario Drug Policy Research Network revealed that between July 2017 and June 18, there were over 1,000 confirmed opioid-related deaths in the province of Ontario. We also know that 90% of these opioid-related deaths were accidental. These are staggering numbers. Constituents in my writing of Markham Unionville are concerned about the ongoing opioid crisis. Minister, could you please update the members of this legislature on on what our government is doing to address the ongoing opioid crisis in Ontario. Thank you. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Markham Unionville for his important question. Mr. Speaker, our government continues to take the opioid crisis seriously. Our government has conducted extensive consultations spanning the entire province that has directly informed our new consumption and treatment services model. These consultations saw the participation of experts, 
health care workers, first responders, community leaders, business owners and stakeholders, including the Opioid Task Force. Today, we've approved 16 CTS sites in communities with the highest needs across the province. This new model, Mr. Speaker, saves lives by helping to reverse and treat overdoses, and it connects people who use drugs to primary care, treatment and rehabilitation, and other health and social services. Response. Mr. Speaker, since the very beginning, our government has remained committed to investing $3.8 billion over 10 years to build a comprehensive and connected mental health and addiction system in the province of Ontario. Supplementary. Speaker, I want to thank the Minister for this response. This is reassuring to hear that our government is continuing to take the ongoing opioid crisis seriously. I know that residents in my riding will be pleased to hear that we are taking real action to fight the opioid crisis and are providing the necessary uh, services and supports to the individuals living in an, uh, in, an, in an addiction. Minister, could you please explain to the members of this legislature about the investment we are making this year to address the ongoing opioid crisis? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, I want to thank the member for that great question. Mr. Speaker, based on extensive consultation with experts, we're confident that the model that's brought forward is the right approach to connect people struggling with addiction to the care they need and deserve. Mr. Speaker, in addition to our commitment to invest $3.8 billion over 10 years, our government is investing an additional $174 million this year to address the critical gaps in our system to support patients, families and caregivers in their communities struggling with mental health and addictions. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that we don't truly save a person's life until we help them beat their addiction. Our overriding priority to ensure that all efforts to combat the opioid crisis is being done is something that we take very seriously and that we need to do. Response. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure all members of this legislature that our government is working tirelessly to ensure that we are able to create a connected, comprehensive and integrated mental health and addiction system for the province of Ontario. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today, we're joined by professional firefighters from across the province, including two from my riding of Niagara Falls. None of us here will dispute they've got just about the toughest job around. As first on the scene for anything from major fires to a fatal car crash, our firefighters have to be at their best when often we're at our, at our worst. Then they're left to process what they've experienced. Presumptive PTSD coverage legislation Champion and first introduced by the New Democrats passed in 2016. Municipalities are now required to submit PDSD prevention plans, but not necessary to follow through on those plans. Will the minister tell the House what concrete steps, including funding, has the government taken to ensure that our firefighters receive the same standard of post traumatic stress care no matter where they serve? I leave the questions addressed to the Premier. Uh, Mr. Labour. Refer to the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first, I'd like to begin uh, on behalf of uh, the Premier, on behalf of uh, the Government of Ontario, and on behalf of uh, every member of the provincial legislature to welcome our professional uh, firefighters uh, who are here with us today. Uh, as well, Mr. Speaker, uh, on behalf of uh, every single person uh, in Ontario, every family and every community across the province, to uh, sincerely and truly thank them uh, for everything that they do uh, for, to protect our families uh, across the province. Mr. Speaker, uh, our government will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with every first responder uh, in the province of Ontario. I know uh, my office and I have had uh, a number of conversations with the professional firefighters, and we continue uh, to work with them uh, to send that message that we're going to stand with them every step of the way. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. Firefighters find themselves exposed to toxics that can cause cancer at higher rates than other members of our population. These exposures don't just happen at the scene of the fire, but continue on their gear and equipment firefighters use at the fire station and even back in their homes 
with the potentially to affect their families. We know that firefighters and first responders are heroes in all our communities. Right now, guidelines are being created that will help protect the health and safety of firefighters. And this is good. But only if this government follows through will the minister commit today to implementing, through regulation, any recommendations this committee makes to keep our firefighters safe on and off the job. Minister to reply. Great. Thank you uh, very much again. I want to thank the professional firefighters, the leadership, and, and their members for being here today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as uh, the member uh, opposite uh, likely knows, uh, our ministry, the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development, uh, is currently um, uh, undergoing and reviewing uh, occupational uh, cancers. In fact, Mr. Speaker, uh, our ministry has commissioned uh, international uh, expert, world-renowned uh, expert, Dr. Uh, Paul Demers. Uh, I met with Dr. Demers uh, last night, Mr. Speaker, uh, actually at Mars, uh, joined uh, the medical community, joined uh, many of our friends uh, in the building trades when it comes uh, to cancers related from asbestos. And, Mr. Speaker, when it comes uh, to the Section 21 committee that the member opposite uh, referenced, uh, I've been attending uh, Section 21 uh, committee uh, meetings, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're going to continue to work with professional firefighters, continue uh, to demonstrate leadership, and continue to tell them and show them that we stand shoulder to shoulder and thank them for what they do. Next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. First of all, I want to thank the Minister for coming to my riding of Perry Sound Muskoka to speak to tourism operators last week. I know they appreciated speaking with her firsthand about the challenges they face. The Minister often says that Ontario offers the world in one province. During the summer, this is true. You can take part in festivals celebrating any culture on any weekend in Toronto, Ottawa and many cities. For example, I know the minister went to a Highland Games, Caribbean Festival, Southeast Asian Festival, and a Chinese event all in one weekend in a riding of an Nepean. Minister, while that's great in the summer months, many people see winter as a time to hibernate. I know there are great things to do around Ontario in the winter, but how do Ontario communities encourage more people to get out and enjoy our province in the winter? Yeah. Yeah. Minister of Heritage. From Perry Sound, Muskoka. I want to say thank you to him for his wonderful hospitality last week when we uh, we took in some local sites and had some great meetings. I went to Bracebridge with him, where they shot the uh, Netflix uh, original uh, the night before Christmas and screened it last week. I encourage all residents of Ontario to check out some of our wonderful film-friendly locations. In addition, we learned of a wonderful uh, skating opportunity for Ontarians if they'd like to visit to the Muskoka Lakes and Winery. There are uh, acres worth of uh, skating on the uh, cranberries is, is amazing. The truth is, Ontario tourism represents about a $34 billion economic imprint in the province of Ontario, with over 142 million visitors uh, taking in our sites year-round. And I'd like to point out that we are open for business, we are open for jobs, and we are open for visitors 365 Spots. days of the year. And that's why our tourism strategy will focus on making sure that that $34 billion economic imprint continues to grow as we work with the Tourism Industry Association of Ontario and the wonderful. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, it's great to hear that Ontario is open for visitors 365 days a year. Winter is a great time to travel around Ontario to ski, skate, see sand in my riding, and to attend winter festivals. In my riding at Perry Sound, Muskoka, this weekend, the CP Holiday Train visits Mac Tier. At the end of January, Bracebridge hosts their Fire and Ice Festival featuring fire artists, fireworks, a skating trail, and the legendary downtown tube run that turns the main street into a tubing hill. And in February, Gravenhurst hosts the North American Cup Original Pond Hockey Classic Tournament where 4-4 four four hockey is played on the pond where the sport was born. Can the minister tell us how she's working with the tourism industry to support winter tourism to communities that traditionally rely on summer tourism? Minister. 
you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The truth is, whether you're in the Thousand Islands, whether you go to Niagara Falls or you go to Muskoka, you are looking at the most beautiful and picturesque places in the entire world, regardless of which season we're operating in. And that's why our tourism strategy that we will move forward with will ensure that we are open for business, open for jobs, and open for visitors 365 days of the year so that we can take in those wonderful um, opportunities. The truth is also in this ministry, Speaker, we host a number of sport hosting events that will continue to roll out as uh, in, in the winter months as well as in the spring and the fall. We're going to continue to uh, work with our film and television operators uh, right across this province to ensure that they're going to film friendly locations, not just in Ottawa and Toronto, but elsewhere in our wonderful province. And through Celebrate Ontario, we'll continue to fund excellent events like Winterfest in Vaughan, the Festival of Lights, which is happening right now in Niagara, Response. and uh, the Twenty Valley Festival that's happening right now um, in Winterfest. So, Mr. Speaker, we are a, a province that is the world in one province, but at the same time, we are making sure that we are a four-season destination the world over. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the President of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario appeared before a legislative committee to warn about the consequences of Bill 132. He said that if the Premier was going to weaken protections for drinking water while reducing penalties for polluters, the municipal officials should not face prosecution for any harms caused by the Premier's short-sighted decisions to scrap important water protections. Mr. Speaker, it is unbelievable that in 2019 we are rolling back water protections to the point that municipal leaders are fearful that they will be held liable for a future disaster that is made in almost inevitable by this government's short-sightedness. Will the Premier withdraw Schedule 9 of Bill 132 and stop risking the safety of Ontario's drinking water? To the government to respond, Deputy Premier. Forces. Referred to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and thank you, thank you to the member for the question. Uh, I can tell you that uh, from the ARA, the Aggregate Resources Act point of view, we are making changes that are going to ensure that Ontario has an adequate supply of aggregates over the next 15 to 20 years when there's massive Order. growth taking place in the province. And protection of water is of a paramount responsibility and of paramount importance. And that's why we have ensured that through changes to the Act that the ability to go below the water table will rest on the province's shoulders, not the municipalities, so that we'll have a one, one source uh, point for responsibility for those actions. But I want to point out that anyone who does go below the water table, Response. if they're approved, will have to go through a rigorous, more rigorous uh, environmental assessment than they have before. Protection of water is paramount in this province. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, I don't understand why this Premier is so determined to repeat the same mistakes that led to the Walkerton disaster. He tried to do an end run Order. around the Clean Water Act with Bill Order. 66. Order. He repealed the Toxics Reduction Act. He's scrapping nine regulations that limit discharges of industrial water pollution. He's overruling municipal plans that protect threats to groundwater due to aggregate extraction. And he's reducing penalties for polluters. Will it take another Walkerton for this Premier to realize that protecting our drinking water is not red tape? Minister to reply. Minister of the Environment. Oh, referred to the Minister of the Environment, no. Conservation and Parks. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Listen, uh, I take objection to the member's question there. We have not lowered any fines to any polluters in this province. In fact, we have tremendously increased our ability to oversee uh, facilities across this province. Mr. Speaker, we have increased the amount of monetary penalties that can be enforced in this province, Mr. Speaker, for those that are polluting our environment. Under the previous governments uh, since the beginning of time, Mr. Speaker, there's been so many facilities that have been allowed to pollute with no tools available to the environmental officers to deal with them. Mr. Speaker, we are adding in those tools to deal with monetary penalties, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, if a business, uh, Mr. Speaker, Order. if an individual is being economically benefited from them polluting the environment, Mr. Speaker, not only will they be charged the monetary penalty, but they can be Response. charged the economic benefit that they also receive from polluting the environment. Mr. Speaker, we are holding polluters, polluters accountable. We are going to be tough with polluters, Mr. Speaker, and assure you, the member opposite, we are keeping our environment, water, land, and air. Thank you very much. 
The next question, the member for Oakville North, Shirlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question today is for the Solicitor General. Protecting citizens is a fundamental responsibility of government, and part of that responsibility is the continued support of the hard-working fire services and firefighters from across Ontario in the work they do keeping our community safe. Speaker, there are a number of different tools and resources that fire services rely on when ensuring the safety of the communities they protect. These aren't always top of mind for everyone, but they have a big impact on fire services' ability to do their job. Could the Solicitor General please let us know how our government is supporting firefighters in Ontario in their vital work keeping the people of Ontario fire safe? Questions to the Solicitor General. Thank you. And uh, thank you to the member from Oakville North Burlington. You know, she's absolutely right. It is an issue that uh, the, the members who have joined us here from the OPFFA understand uh, because they deal with it every day. But frankly, uh, the general public just assumes that when there is an issue, those firefighters are going to come to protect their homes and their families. So to them, thank you for your engagement and thank you for your participation in your lobby day today. Um, you know, earlier this summer, our government announced a $2.5 million in funding for urban search and rescue and chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear and explosive teams, more commonly referred to as hazmat teams. Support for USAR and hazmat teams across Ontario ensures that our brave firefighters have the tools they need to keep our communities safe. And I think these are important tools Response. that when we work together, we can uh, make our communities safer. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. I thank the Solicitor General for her response. Firefighters are truly everyday heroes who put themselves in harm's way to keep our loved ones and our communities safe. When you or I, or I might run away from danger, they run toward it. That is why it is critical that our government continue to support them in their fight to keep Ontario fire safe. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please tell us more about how our government will continue supporting firefighters across Ontario and improving fire safety? Solicitor General again to reply. Thank you. Um, again, our government values the important work that firefighters do as they place themselves at risk every day to protect our communities across Ontario. It's why we will continue to work with our first responders on the front lines of community safety in order to create a public safety regime that puts people first and provides our frontline officers and heroes with the tools and resources they need to keep our communities safe. That's why I was pleased to speak at the OPFFA's recent legislative conference and this morning continued that conversation with members of their executive. As Solicitor General, I look forward to continuing our strong relationship with our firefighters to continue working with them on their essential work in our communities. Thank you. The member for Timmins. My uh, question is to the Deputy Premier. Uh, Deputy Premier, you would know that your government tabled yet again rule changes that are quite frankly going to consolidate even more power into the government's hand. Despite your current record, you have used time allocation over 90 percent of the time that legislation has come through this House. You have used the notwithstanding clause in order to address comments through the chair. Thank you very much, Speaker. You, the government has used time allocation over and over again in order to speed legislation through this House. The government has used even the notwithstanding clause in order to change the electoral process in the City of Toronto in the midst of an election. So Order. the question I have is a very simple Order. one. How does consolidating even more power in your hands enhance the democratic process? The question has been addressed to the Deputy Premier. Referred to the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much. Uh very much, Mr. Speaker. The, the changes to the standing orders that we're proposing do no such thing. As a matter of fact, we've been consulting with all members uh, and all parties, uh, including the NDP and the, uh, the, the uh, Liberals and the Green Party, who are supporting the proposed changes, Ms. Mr. Speaker. It's about making the, making the legislature work better. It's about uh, uh, allowing the independent members—we have a large independent members uh, core here—it's about allowing them the ability to participate more often in debate in this place. I suspect that's part of the reason why the NDP is not in favour of uh, of some of the changes that we're bringing
moving forward, Mr. Speaker. I think that when members take a look at uh, the package in front of them, they'll be happy about it, Mr. Speaker. It's about allowing members to to, uh, to defend the speeches that they make in this place. It's about making it open. It's about making debate more active, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's about transparency. It's about giving independent members a larger voice, Mr. Speaker. And this side of the House will always stand Response. up for all members in making this place an even better place for the people of Ontario. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, to the, uh, to the uh, Acting Premier, this does no such thing as what you're just trying to say. All this does is it allows the government to move legislation through the House lickety-split even faster than you did before. If the Liberals and the Greens are happy with that and are prepared to support you, well then, shame on them. But I can tell you that New Democrats will fight you on this because this legislature is the legislature of the people, Speaker. And at no time should the government consolidate power in such a way that takes the power away from the people. I I ask you again, Order. how does this enhance the democratic process when it comes to the people of this province? Minister of Reply, Mr. Speaker, the standing order changes do no such thing. As a matter of fact, the NDP was cooperating in changing the standing orders and agreed with most of them until, Mr. Speaker, they didn't get their way on something and decided to withdraw support entirely. What the member says is absolutely, completely wrong. We do not give ourselves more powers to pass things any quicker, Mr. Speaker. What we've done is give the legislature more power to debate bills and to question each other back and forth. The member opposite said to the media in and, uh, and, and a number of instances that somehow the changes that we're making will do that, will allow us to pass a bill all in one day. Well, it's completely wrong. We haven't removed the power of the opposition to bring forward reason amendments. We haven't uh, said that we will allow uh, uh, debate and time allocation to happen in the same day. We've added no such thing, Mr. Speaker. What we've done is given the independence an opportunity to, to participate more frequently. We've changed the rules so that member statements can be viewed Response. by all members of, uh, of this House, and we've increased accountability for the government and for all members of this House. So I would hope that the opposition would join with us, join with the independents in making this place better for the people of Ontario. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Whitby. Uh, speaker, my question is for the Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. This month is Adoption Awareness Month, uh, a month, Speaker, to celebrate the families that have opened their hearts to children and youth in need of forever homes. It's also an opportunity, Speaker, to raise awareness and let more people know about adoption as a way to expand their families. Now, Speaker, just last week I was pleased to co-host with my Durham colleagues a roundtable on the state of adoption in Ontario. It was a moving experience, Speaker, to hear firsthand from adoptive families and their struggles in particular. We also heard from many other organizations that they provided their input as well on this important topic. Can the minister please tell the House how she is modernizing the child care system to help more children find their forever home? Great question. The Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Whip from Whitby for that great question. <laughs> the, adoption the Adoption Council of Ontario's theme this year is answering the call. Those who step up to care for children have answered the call, and it is our duty as government to do the same. That is why we have committed to re-examining the adoption system to protect and the interests of children and youth and make adoption easier for those involved. We know that children and youth are not being matched with families as often as they should. For example, in 2018-2019, there were over 4,000 children and youth in the permanent care of children's aid societies in Ontario who were eligible for adoption, yet approximately only 800 of those children and youth were adopted. Speaker, we can do better and we must do better. Our government is proud to support the great work done by groups such as the Parent Support Network, Adopt for Life, and Dave's, Dave Thomas's Foundation for Response. Adoption. Whether it is adoption or kinship care, creating permanency for children and youth in Ontario is a goal that every member of this legislature supports. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you uh, to the minister for her response. And I agree with the minister that we all want children and youth to find their forever homes. Children and youth speaker have better outcomes when they're in permanent homes rather than group homes. They're more likely to finish high school, seek higher education, be more emotionally secure than peers who remain without a permanent family. And, Speaker, adoption is not just for children. Teens, although more independent, still need the love and support that a family can provide to help them navigate life's challenges. 
Speaker, we also know that children with special needs are also in need of homes and that they need just some support to help them reach their potential. Can the minister please tell us what steps the ministry is taking to ensure that the voices of children are heard on this issue? Great. Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member for your question. Speaker, I would like to thank the member and our Durham colleagues for hosting an adoption roundtable. Back in September, my parliamentary assistant, the member for Ottawa West Nepean, made a call to all members in this House to host roundtables as part of our child welfare review. I want to thank him for all the work he has done so far and the continued work he is doing on this file. When it comes to adoption, we will be hosting a roundtable comprised entirely of youth to hear their thoughts on the challenges they faced. Speaker, our government continuously engages with a variety of voices, including current and former youth in care like Jane Kovakova from the Child Welfare PAC, who was here yesterday to make sure all voices are heard. For too long, adults and those who have been in the system Court. have made decisions Fonts. impacting children without seeking their input. We know we must do better, and we are committed to doing just that. Next question, the member for London North Centre. My question is to the Premier. London students are struggling to access French classes, Speaker. The London District's Catholic School Board recently announced that they will not be offering French classes until students enter grade four due to a shortage of qualified teachers. Jean-Pierre Quentin, Executive Director of the Centre Communautaire Régional de London, stated that a lack of resources in French education programs will hurt our Francophone community badly. For students, learning the language of their culture also benefits brain development, concentration, memory, and intelligence. Mm -hmm. The Thames Valley District School Board may end their French immersion kindergarten programs and could scrap the French immersion program currently offered to students in grade seven altogether. Shame. The earlier a young person is able to learn a new language, the more successful they will be. Learning a new language strengthens the student's other language. Literacy skills are universal. We should be encouraging young people to learn French, but this government is letting them down. Response. What Question will rather. the Premier do to ensure London's Francophone and Francophile community can continue to learn French during their early years? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Education. Of the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. The way we ensure that fr the linguistic duality in English and French is provided for every student is to invest in the school board in the London Catholic District School Board. Funding is up over $5 million because of our government's commitment to public education in London, in Middlesex, and every region of southwestern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to French language education, it is this government, under the leadership of this Premier, that's investing more in French language education and preservation than any government in the history of Ontario. A $60 million net increase year over year. We're going to continue to invest, working with the Minister of Francophone Affairs, to protect French language, identity and culture in this province now and into the future. Thank you. That concludes our question period this morning. We have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 136, an act to enact the Provincial Animal Welfare Services Act 2019 and make consequential amendments with respect to animal protection. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill.
and ask the members to please take their seats. On November 6, 2019, Ms. Ms. Jones moved second reading of Bill 136. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be counted by the clerk. Ms. Jones, Ms. Jones. Ms. Mr. Urich, Mr. Urich, Mr. Lecce, Mr. Lecce, Ms. Mulroney, Ms. Mulroney, Mr. Mulroney, Mr. Calandra, Mr. Calandra, Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Ford, Mr. Ford, Ms. Elliott, Ms. Elliott, Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty, Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty, Mr. Hardiman, Mr. Hardiman, Mr. Yakabuski, Mr. Yakabuski, Ms. McLeod, Ms. McLeod, Mr. Tabolo, Mr. Tabolo, Ms. Dunlop, Ms. Dunlop, Mr. Romano, Mr. Romano, Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker, Ms. Thompson, Ms. Thompson, Mr. Downey, Mr. Downey, Ms. Fullerton, Ms. Fullerton, Mr. Sicaria, Mr. Sicaria, Mr. Smith Scott, Ms. Scott, Ms. Cho, Mr. Cho Scarborough North, Mr. Cho Scarborough North, Mr. Rickford, Mr. Rickford, Mr. McNaughton, Mr. McNaughton, Mr. Coe, Mr. Coe, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. McDonnell, Mr. McDonnell, Mrs. Marteau, Mrs. Marteau, Ms. Kanjin, Ms. Kanjin, Mr. Cho Willowdale, Mr. Cho Willowdale, Mr. Gill, Mr. Gill, Ms. McKenna, Ms. McKenna, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mr. Parsa, Mr. Parsa, Ms. Skelly, Ms. Skelly, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Pacini, Mr. Pacini, Mr. Miller Perry. Mr. Miller, Perry, Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry, Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Mr. Tanagasla. Mr. Tanagasla. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Babber. Mr. Babber. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Carhalio. Mrs. Carhalio. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Baumer. Mr. Baumer. Mr. Smith, Peterborough, Quarter. Mr. Smith, Peterborough, Quarter. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Anon. Mr. Anon. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Mr. Kanapathy. Kanapathy. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. M Madame Jelly. Madame Jelly. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Tavis. Mr. Tavis. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Yermonta. Ms. Yermonta. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Der Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosevich. Mr. Rakosevich. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mademoiselle Simard. Mademoiselle Simard. All those opposed to the motion, please rise, one at a time, and be counted by the clerk. The ayes are 107, the nays are zero. The ayes being 107, the nays being zero. I declare the motion carried. Second reading of bill, please get back to the floor. Pursuant to the order of the House dated November 25, 2019, the bill stands referred to the Standing Committee on Justice Policy. We now have a deferred vote on the motion for second reading of Bill 138 an act to implement budget measures and to enact, amend and repeal various statutes. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell. Ask the members to please take their seats. <laughs> On November 19, 2019, Mr. Phillips moved second reading of Bill 138. 
All those in favour of the motion will please now rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Yurk, Mr. Yurk, Mr. Lecce, Mr. Lecce, Ms. Moroni, Ms. Moroni, Mr. Calandra, Mr. Calandra, Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Fidelli, Mr. Ford, Mr. Ford, Ms. Elliott, Ms. Elliott, Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty, Mr. Smith, Bay of Quinty, Mr. Hardiman, Mr. Hardiman, Mr. Yakabasti, Mr. Yakabasti, Ms. McLeod, Ms. McLeod, Mr. Tabolo, Mr. Tabolo, Ms. Dunlop, Ms. Dunlop, Mr. Romano, Mr. Romano, Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker, Ms. Thompson, Ms. Thompson, Mr. Downey, Mr. Downey, Ms. Fullerton, Ms. Fullerton, Ms. Jones, Ms. Jones, Mr. Sakaria, Mr. Sakaria, Ms. Scott, Ms. Scott, Mr. Cho Scarborough North, Mr. Cho Scarborough North, Mr. Rickford, Mr. Rickford, Mr. McNaught, Mr. McNaught, Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. Pettipes, Mr. McDonnell, Mr. McDonnell, Mrs. Marteau, Mrs. Marteau, Ms. Kanjan, Ms. Kanjan, Mr. Cho Willowdale, Mr. Cho Willowdale, Mr. Gill, Mr. Gill, Ms. Mc. Kenna, Ms. McKenna, Mrs. Martin, Mrs. Martin, Mr. Parsa, Mr. Parsa, Ms. Skelly, Ms. Skelly, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Pacini, Mr. Pacini, Mr. Miller, Perry Sound Muskoka, Mr. Miller, Perry Sound Muskoka, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Osterhoff, Mr. Osterhoff, Ms. Midas, Ms. Midas, Mr. Tanagasper, Mr. Tanagasper, Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris, Mr. Babber, Mr. Babber, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Hogarth, Ms. Kusindova, Ms. Kusindova, Mrs. Tangri, Mrs. Tangri, Mrs. Y, Mrs. Y, Mrs. Carahalios, Mrs. Carahalios, Ms. Park, Ms. Park, Mr. Cazetto, Mr. Cazetto, Mr. Pang, Mr. Pang, Mr. Trian, Ms. Triantafilopoulos, Ms. Triantafilopoulos, Mr. Crawford, Mr. Crawford, Mr. Rashid, Mr. Rashid, Mr. Mr. Baumer. Mr. Baumer. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. No, Mr. Smith Peterborough Quartha. Mr. Smith Peterborough Quartha. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cook. Mr. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please now rise one at a time and Ms. be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Madam Jelena. Madam Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Natashak. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Shumanta. Mr. Shumanta. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Style. Ms. Style. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Mr. Creek. Miller Hamilton East Mr. Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Borgwen. Mr. Borgwen. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovich. Mr. Rakosovich. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Couteau. Mr. Couteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mademoiselle Simard. Mademoiselle Simard. The ayes are 69, the nays are 38. The ayes being 69, the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, Mr. Lecter, Chief J. Duong. Pursuant to the order of the House, dated November 26, 2019, the bill stands referred to the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. We have a deferred vote now on the amendment to Government Notice of Motion No. 73 relating to standing order changes. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell. On November 27, 2019, Mr. Harris moved that Government Notice of Motion No. 73 be amended as follows, that the motion be amended by adding the following at the end, and that the terms of this motion shall come into force at 12.01 a.m. on Tuesday, February 18, 2020. All those in favour of Mr. Harris's motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. 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 M
Mr. Fidel. Mr. Fidel. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Yakabaski. Mr. Yakabaski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Tribolo. Mr. Tribolo. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Sicaria. Mr. Sicaria. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Ms. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mrs. Mar Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Parsa. Mr. Parsa. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Osahoff. Mr. Osahoff. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Mr. Tanagast. Mr. Tanagast. Mr. Babbitt. Mr. Babbitt. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mrs. Tang. Mrs. Tang. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Carhalios. Mrs. Carhalios. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Cazetta. Mr. Cazetta. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Baum. Mr. Baum. Mr. Smith Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith Peterborough Court. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Anand. No, Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mademoiselle Simard. Mademoiselle Simard. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Bisson, Mr. Bisson Madam Jellinger, Ms. Fife, Ms. Fife, Ms. Fife, Ms. Singh Brampton Center, Ms. Singh Brampton Mr. Center, Banto, Mr. Banto, Mr. Natashak, Mr. Natashak, Mr. Tabbish, Mr. Tabbish, Ms. Sattler, Ms. Sattler, Ms. Shaw, Ms. Shaw, Mr. Mamakwa, Mr. Mamakwa, Mr. Ms. Begum, Ms. Begum, Mr. Yard, Mr. Yard, Ms. Taylor, Ms. Taylor, Ms. Yermonta, Ms. Yermonta, Ms. Armstrong, Ms. Armstrong, Ms. Styles, Ms. Styles, Mr. Kernahan, Mr. Kernahan, Mrs. Stevens, Mrs. Stevens, Mr. Gates, Mr. Gates, Mrs. Gretzky, Mrs. Gretzky, Ms. French, Ms. French, Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller, Hamilton. East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Mr. Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Borgwen. Mr. Borgwen. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosevich. Mr. Rakosevich. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Ms. Monty Farrell. Ms. Monty Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. The ayes are 72, the nays are 35. The ayes being 72 and the nays being 35, I declare the motion carried. Are the members ready to vote no. on the main motion as amended? No. You heard some notes. No. This item will therefore remain on the orders and notices paper. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.